Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. We have greetings for those also who are multidimensional, very real. We have greetings for Alcazar. We have greetings for the sacredness and the geometry that is here. Now, dear ones, I have just given you something you should look at. For here I am, a multi-dimensional voice that's hard to believe. Giving greetings to two other multidimensional entities. That's hard to believe. And all of this in the face of a changing energy on the planet, which is also hard to believe. The paradigm shift that we bring to you is the same one that we have talking about that is the potential of the planet for many years. But we sit in it today. From my standpoint, we revel in it today. Dear ones, dear old souls, this, not, this was not guaranteed. I want you to get used to the fact that this planet and consciousness and life itself is going through a real physical transition. The transition that you may think it's going through is that which you believe as an esoteric believer. It's very, very easy for one who has spent many years in esoteric belief to see, feel, sense energy shift. And so many of you are aware. However, you're used to this. You're also sensitive to what I will call some kinds of multidimensional things. Some of you will see the energy. You will be aware of the aura. But I'm talking about the earth. I'm not talking about just the old souls. This planet is going through a physical, multi-dimensional shift. We prepared you for it. Cryon is the magnetic master for the first thing that I did with a grid group. From the moment I got here, 2002 was to move the grid of the planet. Now your magnetic grid is measurable with your compass. And you can go back in those years and find out just how much the magnetic grid altered north. And you can see it for yourself. This was not esoteric. The magnetic grid had to shift. It had to adjust for you. It is difficult for me to even begin to talk to you about what another dimensional shift might bring you. We have told you that you've never had one before, ever. You have lived in an energy, literally, that had one kind of paradigm that never moved. It has become then your staple, the way things are, human nature. Everything is based around the reality you're in. As you begin to shift, consciousness will react. We told you that. We also gave you information about the actual area of space that your solar system is moving into. Astronomers are looking at coming out of the bubble. Go find this. You can. For all of existence of your life on the planet has been in some kind of a cosmic bubble. A protection of a kind of radiation that's coming. 
The radiation is not that which will affect you adversely. It's going to interface with the magnetic grid's new alignment and affect the DNA, creating an advancement in time, a fast track to your evolution. We told you that. You can go check whether it's coming or not. The whole entire planet is going to be subjected to a potential paradigm shift. Now, here is where it gets good. Potential. What do I mean? When I came to you 25 years ago, I said there was a potential shift coming based upon the probabilities of where you were and what you were doing. I say the same thing today. The snowball is rolling. It's hard to stop it from collecting more snow and getting bigger. That is the consciousness of the planet. A slow process that weeds out the dark and the light that takes into account the reactions of all consciousness to the new energy. Imagine if you were invested in dark and evil. Imagine that for a moment. And imagine that this investment was fine as long as nothing changed. You could control what you're used to controlling. All of the darkness would still be yours. And suddenly, there's a little too much light. Something is starting to shift and change. What would you do? And the answer, you would go on a raging campaign of fear in order to keep things the way they were. Does this sound like something you might see? You see, the planet is changing. Not just old souls, not just light workers. If you want to know specifics, ask the indigenous. For their prophecies were all about now. Now, this is news we've been giving you for some time, but I've just compiled it into a few minutes. Dare I say, it's beautiful. The fact that it is happening at all is beautiful. You passed the marker, more than passed marker. You did it with flying colors. It wasn't even close. You didn't need a confrontation. You didn't need a war. You didn't need to reduce the population by millions of people in order to wake up. You did it by yourself. And when the precession of equinoxes arrived, the consciousness of the planet was actually higher than I predicted. And if you want to see that, you can go back and you can look at my first communication with you which you call Cryon Book One, where I gave you some of the potentials which included a mass death experience on the planet which may wake you up, and you didn't need it. You didn't need it. There is a feeling on the other side of the veil that is pride. It is not egotistical pride. It's the kind of pride you would have for a son or daughter who excelled in everything they touched. It's a pride that you are part of it because they carry your seeds. And that's where we are today. Sometimes I would give what appeared to be admonitions and and I would feel powerful about something that I know is happening and taking place on the planet. Never is there frustration on my side of the veil. Excitement. Is it possible for God to be excited? And the answer is yes. Is it possible for that excitement to be based in the only thing that God really has? outside of free choice of yours, and that is love and benevolence. It actually shaped your evolution. And here you are. The road ahead is filled with free choice. 
It's yours. It always was. But there is a confluence of benevolent consciousness which is higher and larger than what we expected at this point in time. I just explained to you what's going on on the planet and why your news looks like it does. I want to give you a parable. Every single parable we have given has been about woe. And if he wasn't mentioned in the parable, it was still about woe. Woe is not a man or a woman, but we call him a he. Just because of the language differences, it helps. Woe is a woe man. A genderless, it is you. Woe represents the human being. Parables are given because they are puzzles and mean other things. But human beings love stories. They relate to stories. And this one is about you and energy. In this particular story, woe is an old soul and a light worker. And he lives in the year 2015. The story of woe is similar, perhaps, to what you might experience. Maybe a little different, because you're all different. But let me paint the picture. I want to tell you who he, she is. And what woe is going through. As an old soul, woe has a lineage. Now listen carefully. <laughs> the lineage of the old soul is one who has fought the good fight. Because this planet up to this point has had a duality which was palatable. You could be an old soul and you could be a compassionate person but it didn't go very far. Whatever light you had was often put out by the incredible amount of negativity and darkness on the planet. War after war, and you had to participate. Regardless of your wisdom, you're in the battlefield. Regardless of your wisdom, the biology of life affected you. Your wisdom had nothing to do with the fact that if you were a woman, you lost children. Sometimes along the way from A to B, just traveling to get away from somebody chasing you. Sometimes it was in birth, sometimes it was in disease, or worse. Who we'll carry that around, dear one? Do you relate to it? Fought the good fight. Negativity, frustration, drama, war, hate was always there. And it was there seemingly in every sector. Difficult. Especially the old, old soul from the beginning of the seeding of humanity went through the phases where humans just never changed. <clears throat> Can you imagine what this has done to woe's countenance? For he comes into this planet and he remembers at some level it's time to fight again. At some level, the akash of every single human being sets the stage of expectation. You come in, ready to battle. Now that particular Akash creates in woe a feeling where he doesn't feel where he can do anything and make a difference. 
But what he knows he can do is survive spiritually, and he does, to be the best human he can, and he tries. The Akash sometimes holds him back because he remembers at some level what it was like to be the shaman, to carry the information that people wanted to heal, to be the intuitive who could read somebody as they stood there. And he remembers what happened. And he remembers an ugly death because they were afraid of him. Those who have magic are witches. The old energy is powerful. The world went to war a number of times and woe was part of it. Both genders were involved. Both genders suffered. It was humanity. Woe well, is walking around in life today with a lack of self-worth. Now you know why. There is no judgment, dear human being, for how you feel about yourself. But there is amazement at what you can't see. Woe is like you. Life for woe is just hanging on. <laughs> All around him. He has to watch and be careful where he goes, what he says, what he does. All his life. But it's okay. Woe knows how to develop self-balance and compassion. He walks life as a happy individual because he has God inside. It's all he needs. But he's still careful. When, go, when woe goes to work, he did not select the people around him. You realize that. But you had to work with him. He had to work with them. There are those he likes more than others. There are those that are frustrating to him. Quite often, those who would be above him in a pay grade are the most frustrating. He tries to go around them, meaning don't listen, don't be where they are. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. He holds it together, but he hears the negativity that they have. He sees others around in distress because of it. Woe tries to cheer them up or battle the energy the best he can. He's used to it, you see. He's a light worker. Woe lives alone. Now, this is a trait of woe. He found himself living alone because it was easier. <laughs> because if he didn't, there was always drama and frustration. <laughs> He had a cat. And to make things worse, the cat didn't like him. <laughs> Imagine having an animal that you're compassionate about that doesn't really like you. He would come home and the cat would pout because he had gone. When it was time for the cat to eat, he knew it because the cat would come up and bite him. But woe loved animals. And it was all the cat had. Woe knew that the cat's life was dependent on him. Despite this, he was still cheerful. He named his cat, Cat. <laughs> Hello, Cat. How are you? I love you, even if you don't love me. <laughs> This was Woe's life. It was not a bad life, actually. He liked it because he was at home with the battles. These were easy battles. There was no war to fight now. He didn't have to join. There was no mass death. There were no plagues anymore. That's odd, isn't it? At a time when there was a fraction of the number of people on the planet where well, there was no air travel to, to carry contagion. 
There were no plagues, none at all. He had gone through three. Now, he didn't know that, but his Akash carried it. He had watched loved ones die in front of him. Such sorrow. It wasn't this time, and he knew it, and he was happy for this. Woe could be a balanced human being, be compassionate. Woe was also a healer. As a light worker, he discovered he could use his talents. He could read the disease in people, and they would come to him. He had a side business as a healer, and it was a good one. But as he approached each one, Woe had to chase away the negativity, both of the Healy and the room. He was used to it. He fought many battles. He was okay. This is Woe's life. Woe had powerful meditations. As a light worker, as an old soul, he could do this. And he knew he could. This was his solace. This is what he loved the most. He had the connection to God. As much as he could. And would the biology allow him in the energy he connected through the pineal to the higher self. And he loved it. Some of his meditations were actually close to visions. Because they were real and he could sense and see. He could smell and feel. He spent the amount of time in meditation that was perfect for woe. He had heard stories that you should meditate a certain amount of time a day, and he realized this was not true for him, that each old soul had their own akash, had their own uniqueness, had their own lessons, and their own ways, and had their own wisdom. He meditated only the amount of time that he needed to balance. But it's what happened in his meditation that I want to tell you about. For almost every single one of them for over three years had featured a door. A door. He saw the door metaphorically. He knew what it meant. It was an opportunity to move into something beyond the door very clear but he could sense what was on the other side there was something more for him more than that if he had the ability to open it and go through it he knew he would never have to come back to where he was woe learned to talk to the door and he knew that the door had a personality, an angelic ability, because it was multidimensional. It could give him information if he wanted. He thought perhaps that the door represented a final lifetime, perhaps even an appropriate death when it was time he would walk through it and never have to come back to the planet. He weighed all of these things in his mind. He didn't know what the door was about until he was able to start talking to it. In the vision, he was limited in what he could ask and the answers that could happen because he knew that he was in a space that was sacred. It didn't work the same way in 3D. The questions he asked were literally that which did not come out of his mouth, but his innate also was involved. That which his consciousness was also involved. He would say to the door, who are you? And the feeling he got, not the voice, because he never heard a voice. He got his messages through his intuition right into his brain as though there were a voice. And the voice was always too beautiful for words. The voice was genderless. The voice was whatever he wanted to hear. It was the most beautiful sound he could imagine. 
And he said, who are you? And the voice said, whoa, I am your future. He didn't understand it. How could the door be my future? Maybe the other side of the door. He saw the door. He admired it. He loved the fact that there was benevolence on the other side. He occasionally, he saw it glow. Underneath the door, he could see light. Whatever was out there in his future, he liked it. Woe continued to have the visions of the door. Sometimes he would simply sit and be with it, knowing that someday he could go through it. He continued to think it was his demise, his death, his last time on the planet, and he looked forward to that time. And then he started asking the door more questions, and it was confusing. Are you my death? And the door smiled at him, actually chuckled, <laughs> and said, no, woe, it's your life. Woe didn't understand. In this vision, he felt powerful enough to grab the doorknob and say, it's time. If it's my life, it's time. And it was locked. He couldn't budget. Nothing was happening. Nothing. He talked to the door. I cannot open you. And the door said, I know. He said to the door, when can I go through? And the door said, anytime you're ready. And Woe said, I'm ready now. And the door said, come on in. He grasped the doorknob and it wouldn't budge. Pulled and pulled and pulled. This was a frustration. The visions were real. Woe knew who he was. As a light worker extraordinary, he had fought the battles. He knew he was wise in the ways of the world. And the door wouldn't budge. He talked to the door. What am I doing wrong? And the door started talking to him. Whoa, come closer. <laughs> I didn't say open the door. I said, come through the door. And whoa started to realize what the door was telling him. He had to drop his 3D reality and walk through matter. And he did. Woe literally walked through the door. <laughs> and in that instant, he got it. Nothing he had ever learned in the old energy was going to work. You can pull on the door. It'll never open. Let me tell you what Woe discovered on the other side because it shocked him. He wasn't in another world. He was in his world in another dimension. A dimension that was not anything he could count or describe, but one where suddenly his self-worth was skyrocketing. To a degree where the akash that he had had dropped away. It was simply gone because the old energy has nothing to do with who he is today. Woe was becoming slightly multidimensional. He went to work and he looked at his boss the source of frustration, the one he wanted to run from so he didn't get any bad instructions. <laughs> and all he saw was a human that he was compassionate about. He wondered about that person's life. He felt sorry that they were frustrated and in drama and egotistical. 
And what he did next would shock and surprise you. He wanted to be closer to the boss because he found that nothing the boss did bothered him at all. He could sit and listen to the things that used to frustrate him and put his stomach in knots, and he wasn't affected. I want to tell you what happened eventually so you'll understand the dynamic. You see, his boss did not get the reaction he used to. No one was fearful in that body of woe anymore. In fact, eventually, the boss asked woe what the change was because he liked it. Woe's dimensionality had affected somebody else who was not even interested in changing dimensions. This is a process you're not used to. Everywhere woe started to walk, things became easier. The old energy of battle and fighting, he realized, was a caveman survival instinct, and he was beyond it. He didn't meet darkness where he went because it ran from him. Woe carried a light that was so impressively bright, metaphorically, to that which is darkness, hatred, frustration, and drama that it literally left the building when he arrived. He walked the streets differently. He expected good things. And the door in his vision was gone. When he seemingly tried metaphorically to turn around to see where the door had gone, there was none. He couldn't go back. He couldn't go back. Woe went home, and there was Cat. Cat one, took one look at Woe and rubbed against his leg. He started purring. That's all it took, dear ones. The animals know first. Then even the plants and the rocks. The whole planet knows when you become a little different. And from that moment on, there were no more bites, just purrs and rubbing. What's for dinner? I'm going to close and ask you, What's for dinner? Are you going to leave here differently or the same? Does this parable make sense to you? If you don't understand the hows and the whys, the timing, the actions, if you are at a loss for the practical meanings, I will say this, you're not alone. I just gave you the overall perspective. In order to go through the door, every single one of you will have a different kind of way. This is honoring to your akash, to your individuality. But mo listen, if you didn't get it, if you want to go through the door, your cellular, actual cellular body will start to shift and change. You want to heal yourself? Is it time? Go through the door. Because we want you to stay, and we don't want you to stay in distress. This energy is not cooperating with your consciousness. Have you got it yet? And that's why some of the things are happening to you that are happening to you. You're not supposed to stick around in this energy the way you are. It's time to vibrate higher. Go through the door. What's for dinner? I am in love with humanity for what you're about to do.